Simple models provide considerable advantages over more simple estimation techniques. For example, it allows for the simultaneous estimation of both level 1 and level 2 characteristics while accounting for any clustering at level 2 that may be occurring. So pretty much everybody who does research on people in countries does stuff like this. Um, people in schools, really common. Uh, organizational research does this. So if you're looking at um, the effects of um, a, you know, an organizational level outcome on individuals within organizations, you would want to use multi-level models then. Um, the patient doctor example, again, is a good one where you would want to look at doctor characteristics, but you've got a sample of doctors and their patients. And so you would assume that the patients are more similar to each other by doctor than they are to one another. Um, uh, same, same deal with countries a lot of times or regions. Uh, we want to look at fertility outcomes. We would expect that people in the same country would probably have more similar pro um, fertility outcomes than people in other countries or that country level predictors are going to be useful when understanding fertility outcomes. So for estimating fertility, certainly a mother's age, for example, a mother's education is going to be an important factor. But we'd also expect that country level GDP to be a pretty big factor in cross national differences in fertility. So we expect countries with a higher GDP or individuals in countries with higher GDP to have lower fertility than those in countries with, well, I guess it's kind of a U shape actually. But uh, I use multi level models in my own research to help understand why people are poor. So we know there are a lot of individual level characteristics that determine whether people are poor, such as whether they went to college, whether they have a job, whether they're a single mom. But we also think that there are some pretty strong country level characteristics or other community level characteristics that determine whether individuals are poor. For example, when we look at the cross national differences in poverty rates, there are considerable differences. So in Sweden, for example, and the other Scandinavian countries, we see sustained and continuous poverty rates much, much lower than those of the United States. Now we understand that some of them may be that they have more highly educated populations, but there's also likely to be something, something happening at the country level to make these differences occur. People in my area of research argue that the welfare state is one of these important predictors, that that social safety net can help everyone in that country in a very similar way. And because we don't have that safety net in the United States or don't have as strong of a safety net, we experience poverty considerably at considerably higher rates. These multi-level models allow us to control for those differences among the individual populations and account for the fact that some individuals may not have gone to college, some may be living at um, single parents, for example, um, but also allows us to estimate this national variation as well. Uh, another major advantage of using multi-level models is the pooling of level one characteristics and estimation. So let me provide a more concrete example of where this can be useful. Say for example, we want to know how being Muslim in Western Europe affects your support for the government. Well, if we had a standard sample, we may be concerned that the number of Muslims in each country is too small to adequately estimate the effects. However, with using a multi-level model, we would pull everyone at the individual level and estimate the effects of being Muslim for everyone in the sample. In this way, we actually don't need as many people within each group as we would otherwise. With multi-level models, it's actually better to have more groups than there are individuals in groups. You can also can relate this to um, a doctor-patient study. So if we're interested in how doctor characteristics may affect patient, patient outcomes, but we only have um, you know, 10 or so patients per doctor, it's really not a problem. If we're interested in how um, race may affect this outcome, we may only have you know, a handful of minority patients per doctor, or some doctors may have no minority patients at all. However, in pulling them together, we're able to still adequately estimate the effects um, at level one. So generally, when you run one of these commands to get your output from a multi-level model, it should look pretty familiar. Everything is gonna look a lot like a standard regression in that, especially with a random intercept model, since all of the X's, that's the individual level independent variables anyhow, are gonna be fixed. 
and should reflect something very similar to what you would do if you did um, regular OLS with clustering adjusted or random effects a model, for example. Um, however, you will notice that even more so than in previous models, your level two variables, um, in this case school funding, would much higher standard error than you would otherwise expect since this is measuring those effects at level two and taking into account the clustering. So if we were to run a, re a, a regular OLS regression, admittedly violating the assumptions with the two school example, uh, with the two schools, for example, we would see that our level two measure, so that of the schools, would be considerably inflated because it doesn't take into account the clustering of individuals in these schools and just thinks that there's a really strong relationship since it doesn't know that they're actually in the same school. Instead, when you run a multi-level model, because it's running the, or because it's testing the effects of the level two variables in a separate reg regression, it's taking into account the number of observations at level two, and so the, and so the estimates will be much more conservative, and you'll notice that your standard errors will be much larger, your T is much smaller, and giving you a much more accurate estimation of what the actual effects are at level two. So while we've only talked about two level models in our examples thus far, you can also have three or more levels. So if we were interested, for example, of uh, individuals in schools, in school districts, we could do that as well. And not only that, we could also estimate random intercepts for not only level one, but also level two. If we had more levels, we could estimate more parameters. So if we had students in classes, in schools, in districts, in states, we actually have a five level model and we'd be able to estimate random intercepts for all four up to the top level. Same way with random coefficients, we can start estimating them at, random, or at various levels um, except the top. Again, keeping in mind that this is increasingly, um, making the model increasingly complex. It's fairly common in cross-national research. People uh, will do um, three-level models. So they'll do individuals nested in country years, nested in countries, assuming that um, you know, the countries are going to be consistently enough, consistent enough across time. But also we have, um, this would be in a multi-wave data set. So if we had individuals across countries in 1980, 1990, 1995 and 2000, we have several country years. We'd also have hopefully several countries and in that way we could create a three level model and try to estimate some things that might have happened um, at the country level and also controlling for the clustering that would happen at the country year. Mm -hmm.